Hi everybody, thank you very much. My name is Khulud Hilmi. Um, um, sorry. I co-founded a newspaper called Hanabilidi in 2011 along with Nabil Sherbaji and others. Um, I've been uh, working as a journalist since the beginning of 2011 and um, um, currently I'm a board member of the, the newspaper Hanabilidi. Can you perhaps um, go a little bit more de detail on how this outlet in particular came about, but also because I think it's of, of interest of the prosecution and the panel, um, a little bit of if, if it's before 2011, how things just stood and how things changed possibly after sure. 2011. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, so um, in 2011, uh, when what we call the Arab Spring started uh, in Syria, we were anticipating that something similar is going to happen. Um, to be very honest, I wasn't, I've never been part of any political movement or any social change movement before 2011. Um, I was doing my master's degree in interpretation and translation at Damascus University at that time. Uh, when in February 2011, I remember that we met, uh, I met with a couple of friends and we were just analyzing what is happening in Egypt and Tunisia. And we were counting down what is going to happen in Syria. Um, and in March, 20, um, March 2011, when the people started to take up into the streets, I participated with them. Um, and I was part of the uh, movement in my hometown, Daria. And I was part of the, especially of the female movement in, in, in the city. Uh, at that time, uh, we had, I mean, not only at that time, like with, uh, I never remember that we had any free press in Syria. Uh, media in Syria was completely or totally con controlled by the state. Um, only after Bashar al-Assad came into power, he's, I mean, he came with that civilized, secular face to the country as a young uh, man who was educated in the UK. He was uh, uh, like an optician, a like a practicing eye doctor who uh, studied in the UK. And when he came to Syria, he introduced another kind of a rev revolution. It called like he introduced the internet access to Syria, where people started to access the internet. He allowed us to have satellite channels, and that time we immediately started to get satellites all over the places. <laughs> and we started to have the luxury of watching news on other channels. Um, you can hear Al Jazeera in every single house without being persecuted at that time. Because, I mean, it has nothing to do with Syria or any other change we, we, change in the world. We are only allowed to watch the news. But our access to the internet was completely limited, where we had very limited access to anything. But, I mean, you can Google haphazard things, but we could have never have access to Wikipedia, for example, or encyclopedia when encyclopedia used to be a thing. Um, so, uh, yes, he introduced some changes to the country and people were very optimistic that he's going to be a little bit different from his father or from the tight grip of the security forces in Syria. But unfortunately, when the Syrian revolution started, we realized that, I mean, I can mention that he is, I've never been there when the, I mean, I was born in 1985, so it was like years after the 1980s incident, but I've heard many things from my parents and from people who uh, were in my close family about the bad situation during the 1980s, but I've never anticipated that in 2011, where human rights is a thing in the world and um, everyone have access to the internet, that the same atrocities are going to be committed by the same regime and no one is going to say anything or the, the whole universe is going to turn a, a blind eye about that. Um, so we were very optimistic back then, uh, as um, doc, uh, my colleague Hala Kudmani mentioned before. Um, at the beginning of the Syrian uprising, uh, international journalists were not uh, given access to Syria, so visas were denied to, to be given to national 
to international journalists and journalists such as uh, Mary Colvin and her colleagues who had access to Syria, they they accessed Syria without visas, so they they entered um, Syria without visas, and she was killed by the regime when she was covering the um, the atrocities committed by the Syrian regime in Homs city in in Baba Amr. Um, so at that time, uh, while demonstrating, we used to distribute pamphlets. We used to distribute um, like instructions to, to the people how to protect their safety and security regarding cybersecurity, why we are protesting, why democracy is important, why we want change in the country. But then at the end of 2011, we decided that we have access. We come from a very local um, place uh, adjacent to Damascus, the, the, the capital, it doesn't mean anything to be adjacent to Damascus, the capital, but I mean, I insist on this because when the Syrian uprising started in my city in, in March 2011, um, immediately after, in April 2011, we started to have tanks closing the entrances of my city to Damascus, the country. And back then I was um, a translator as, at a law firm, so it took me an hour and a half to access my office every single day while it's 20 minutes drive to go back to that office. And the office manager refused to believe that we have tanks at the entrance of my city. So every day he accuses me of why being late. And I was like, we have checkpoints that I have to wait for an hour and a half. And he couldn't believe even. So we said that if people in Damascus, the city, can't see the tanks at the entrances of my city, which is 20 minutes drive, so how the world is going to believe that we have violations against human rights? So we decided that, OK, it's a risk, but we have to take that risk. We know how to write in Arabic. I mean, it's not, it's not only to write in Arabic, but we, are, uh, we have the capacity to write proper things in Arabic. We thought that, okay, why not? So we were amateurs. We were around 25 people who decided to take that risk. To be very honest with you, it was an idea suggested by Yahya Sherbaji, also one of the people who we lost in my city early at the beginning of the Syrian uprising. It was a dream of Yahya and carried out by Nabil, who insisted on carrying on Yahya's dream. So they suggested the idea and we, we went, I mean, we stepped in. We just, we just said yes. Um, uh, if you ask me now if I was aware of the risks of that thing, I don't know, to be honest. I thought that people are monitoring from outside and maybe they can protect us, but unfortunately no one protected us. Um, so we started to go in the streets, interviewed people about what is going on. We were eyewitnesses to everything going on in the streets. We were at eyewitnesses to the arbitrary arrest of the people demonstrating. I have seen people taken from the streets in front of me. I've seen people being shot by rubber bullets um, my cousin was shot in his face by a rubber bullet and we were not able to take him to any hospital because he is considered immediately by the regime as an, like a terrorist. So he had to suffer until um, he went like through, I don't know, hundreds of tens and hundreds of uh, plastic surgery to, re I mean, to, to, to return back to normal. And I've seen people passing out uh, because the regime uh, threw gas uh, bombs into them because they were demonstrating. I was about to be arrested several times while demonstrating myself in the streets. And we were doing nothing. We were just calling for, at the beginning, we were calling for change in democracy. But immediately after, we started to call for the immediate release of those who were arrested by the regime. And, and unfortunately, that was a crime um, considered by the regime. And we were number one. Uh, wanted. So when we took the decision to, to co-found the newspaper, um, we took an oath or something that we took upon ourselves that we are not going to disclose who we are. So we have to work in, in secret. So no one ever uh, mentioned anything that we are reporting or we are the ones who co-founded the newspaper. We've never had the chance to meet in person. I was telling colleagues bef like early before that we missed even the chance or the luxury to sit together and um, look at ourselves in the eye and discuss anything like anyone normal. 
So we had to use Facebook and Skype to have our meetings and discuss things. As I have mentioned, we were amateurs. No one had did media before. And Nabil was the only professional who, who completed his media studies in 2010. Uh, graduated from Damascus University as a professional journalist, and he was our mentor. But unfortunately, we lost him too early. Um, we started designing our, the idea of Annabelle um, started to be crystallized in December 2011, and we had our first edition in January 20, 2012. And we lost Nabil in February 2012 to the prisons of the regime. Um, so this is how we participated in this, and this is how we took part into that. So we continued after Nabil as well. We continued to report. And um, I say that we also lost the luxury of mourning the people whom we lost at the beginning, or we lost the luxury of considering that we lost them or they are not part of us anymore because we were in constant wait for them. So tomorrow Nabil is going to be released. Tomorrow he's going to return back to us and be our mentor. Tomorrow he's going to work with us. Tomorrow I will get the chance to see him at, like face to face and get the chance to, I mean, uh, to see him. But unfortunately, we only realized that he was killed under torture in 2018. And he was killed two years before 2018. So we also lost the luxury to mourn him properly back then. Because um, uh, it's too late. It's too late even to think that we lost th this person. And we already lost six or seven out of our founding members back then. So um, um, we continued after Nabil loss. We went to the streets and interviewed people. Um, we also uh, di distributed the magazine to the people inside my home city, but we also smuggled the newspaper to Damascus. I smuggled Anna Beledi several times to Damascus. And I crossed checkpoints with, with 15 to 30 copies of Annabelle in my bag. I was about to be arrested twice by the security forces in, Dama in, in Dari and in Damascus. But I, I survived by a miracle, but they didn't. I mean, Nabil, um, who was killed under torture. My brother was arrested in May 2012, and he co-founded the newspaper with us and... I also don't know if he is alive or dead. Uh, we lost Ahmed Jhadi, who is our managing editor as well. He was in, in prison. He was detained twice, released by the, by the regime after these two times, and then he was hit by a missile in Daria. We lost our reporter who co-founded the newspaper as well in Daria as well. He was killed by, by shelling to the city. And we lost other two in detention centers as well. Um, and they were killed by the regime. So all the losses that we have seen um, did not stop us from continuing. Today, Annabella D stands as one of the, if I may so very proudly say so, that it's one of the more, most prominent independent Syrian out news outlets in Syria considered by professional uh, journalism organizations and uh, we continue only because we have a burden to continue because it's a dream for those who passed away or killed by the regime including Nabil it's it's a dream of Nabil to be honest and we carried out that, that dream thank you could we just get a sense and it's also as it progressed of the content um, in the newspaper, and I'm sure it has evolved quite a bit, particularly. Yeah. But just a little bit of from those days to today yeah. and the methodologies that you guys use in the investigation and in the reporting, please. Uh, of course. So when we started, we we had, like, we, rea we know or we realized very early that we had uh, the credit to report from wherever we are. So if you have, we have access to that area. So we have access also to neighboring towns and villages, and we have access to Damascus. So if you have access to people outside wherever you are, and you go interview them in person, and you were there to witness if if the regime has um, 
shot the demonstrators dead or arrested somebody. So we, we, we know how to double check the fact back then. Um, so, you know, because you are in the, in the area, you interview people and you get the, a, a, like, a, like a clear sense of what happened to their loved ones, I mean, in person. And then we report the news. So we own the local news back then. So that was a credit. But the um, other topics we reported is that um, Nabil was uh, a very highly political and social change activist even before 2011. Um, so he uh, he supports nonviolence uh, movement in the world. So he was highly supportive of the nonviolence movement in the Syrian revolution. And I think this is really impacted how we developed an ability, despite the fact that we were not comrades, like we were not friends of his own movement back then. But he influenced us in one way or another where we are not going to follow violence. So whenever there are any news about military or about any violence committed by the regime, we we only say that this happened, but we never um, tell the people to go and act the same. You know what I mean? We've never done any articles to encourage people to use violence against the government. Rather, I mean, use your voice and demonstrate as a power to um, as a power for change. Uh, so mainly the articles were um, awareness raising, why change is important, why democracy is important, why elections are important. Um, I don't know if, if this is something good or bad, but I've never voted my whole life. And I am now 36, turning 37 very shortly. I've never voted in my whole, whole life. I mean, the state vote for me. I've realized that my name is used to um, for referendums in Syria, but I've never, never used my voice. And that's why we were telling the people about why important to have your vote, why it's important to have your voice, including the news from, from the ground. But shortly after, we realized that we have to cover everywhere. We have to cover all of Syria. So the complication is how to get reporters from different cities and how to have access to these people, how to trust the other behind your screen and get the news from them. So I was responsible for developing the network of reporters inside Syria. So if I know someone that I trust in person that comes from home city, let's say, so I go to him or her and ask them to, to connect me to another person that they trust and then they connect me to some, I call them citizen journalists, and I was one of them when we started Anna Belady in 2011. So they connect me to that person, and then I get my news from that person. Um, and very proudly, I can say that we didn't double check the news when we reported them at that time. I mean, I know that somebody tells me that there's something happening. I watched that on Al Jazeera or in a BBC or whatever, so I know that it happened. So we report it in the newspaper. But later on, I realized that sometimes people, they exaggerate numbers. So it's not a thousand people, it's less. It's not hundreds of people, it's less. So I need to get another connection to somebody who can double check the information. Um, and this is how we grew up. This is how we built our networks from all over Syria. We used to have reporters from Dara, from Derzor, from Tartus, from Homs Hama, and um, if I mentioned Derzor and then Hasaka. And then we grew larger and lar larger, and then we had reporters from different parts. Tess is being asked by the translators if you can slow down a little oh, bit. Yeah, so they were. <laughs> for, Sorry for this. I have the same problem. Uh, the, the other, so the question we've been talking about uh, blacklisting mm -hmm. and the potential existence of uh, black lists that the regime forces will have. Uh, did you ever came across or were you guys publishing any of these findings or they were, this was something known? Names of blacklisted people, you mean? That's right. Journalists in your outlet or in different outlets coming out that may be uh, being targeted or being exposed by the regime as, as potential future targets. Um, as far as I know, you don't know if you are blacklisted or not. So you, you, you learn that you are blacklisted by a mere chance. 
So it's either you are going to a checkpoint and then you realize that the secret police or the security intelligence forces are looking for you. If you are lucky, um, you realize before they take you or you just like, you get by a, like a mere miracle outside of the checkpoints, but then you are arrested. Nabil was blacklisted. He realized that he is blacklisted because he, he was in prison like several times. Others, they know or we know that they are blacklisted. And that's why we didn't get the chance to meet Nabil in person. Because during the months, like the very few months that we had to have with him as colleagues um, working on the same new newspaper, Nabil was changing his place every now and then because he knows that the regime forces are. So they used to conduct haphazard and, and very specific checks to houses. So it's either random check or they are looking for someone specific. So when they arrested my brother, they came home specifically to take or to arrest my brother. But Nabil was hiding and when they arrested him, uh, if I, if you allow me, allow me to mention one thing in here is that we didn't lose Nabil as a person. So Nabil, when we lost him, yes, he was a co-founder of Hanab Baladi. Yes, he was an activist in Syria. But when we lost Nabil, we also lost part of our memory, part of our archive. Because prior to co-founding Hanab Baladi, Nabil Sherbaji co-founded the media office in the um, Daria coordination where they started to set up coordinations all over Syria. So he had the archive of footages, videos of demonstrations of our, like some of the arbitrary arrests in the streets. And sometimes people were so courageous to uh, film and record the regime forces when they broke out into houses and arrested people. So when he was arrested by the Syrian regime, he was arrested along with his laptop, his mobile phone, and I, I can't count how many hard drives were with him. So we lost that memory as well. And I believe that history is written by the victorious. And after 10 years of the Syrian uprising, Assad still remains as a victorious. And When we will read the history, it's going to be his own copy, its own rhetoric of the events that happened. And by then, it's not going to be we lost them once, but it will be that we lost them twice when they were arrested by the regime, killed under torture. And then when their stories are going to be read by the next generation as terrorists who oppose the state. So, um, Tell me, how many people are part of Inaf Baladi now? We're a big organization now. Thank you for taking me back to now. Um, I think Inaf Baladi office in Istanbul now hosts over 40, 40 people. Uh, yes, we started the newspaper as amateurs, but I did my master's degree in media and development at SOAS University in London in 2017. And the people who are reporting, I mean, the journalists working for Anna Belladi now in the office, they are all journalists. They did media, they studied media. This is the youngest generation that took the, um, I mean, they decided that they want to work for Anna Belladi, of course, and they are reporting for us or working for, for Anna Belladi. Um, so we are a big team now. And I mean, mainly our main location is Istanbul. So our, our office look, relocated to Istanbul in 2014. That was my next question. What are the conditions under which you and your colleagues are reporting these days? Now or in the past? Now. Now. So um, it's complicated. Um, so we report things freely regarding Syria, where we are and what we are going to report. Um, the de facto in Syria now is very challenging and it's very complicated. As uh, Professor uh, Ugur mentioned that now we have regime controlled areas, we have um, PYD controlled areas, we have um, um, Al-Nusra controlled areas, we have Turkish controlled areas in, in parts like in northern parts of Syria. So um, if, if you send 
the co-founders of Annabelle of or some like myself or the editor in chief or the managing editor to Syria now, they will be executed by I don't know whom. Like it's not only the regime, but it's also the extremists that we are reporting their crimes. It's also the armed groups that we reported that they have committed violations against human human rights. It's also the whatever, like all the de facto. Um, uh, like let's say like it's the de facto um administration uh, bodies inside syria so um we operate like we still report freely we still write whatever we want but um annabella d used to be printed in turkey and shipped into syria uh up until recently where we we found out that it's very expensive to print it and ship it to Syria. Rather, we do something else. Um, and due to like lo logistic challenges as well. But up until the moment that we used to send the copies back to the um, liberated areas or, or out of the regime controlled areas, the magazine or the newspaper was burnt by de facto regimes twice there. And they threatened our reporters that they want to prosecute them as well. So it's a still challenging to work wherever. So in the office, it's safe, kind of. The uh, working environment is very challenging. So it's, it changes according to the political changes in Turkey. So whenever there are like high demands for sending Syrians back to Syria, I mean, people are afraid to walk in the streets. We are fully registered in Turkey, but we, we suffer from getting um, work permits there. So uh, you have to jeopardize having professional people working for you or someone who got the Turkish citizenship or they are Turkish people, I mean, Turkish citizens um, instead. So you protect their um, legal status in Turkey. So it depends. It's not, it's not optimal but it's fine it's safe at least so far i mean so far but for our reporters those who report from the regime controlled areas they they don't reveal their identity it's risky so i work with people who report for me for several months and then it's too dangerous for them it's not the it's the mental pressure on them that they are reporting for an independent media which is considered a position that they tell us that I can't move on so they have the full freedom to leave and then they leave and then you find another one. For those reporting from um, the SDF controlled areas, I mean, they also don't, I mean, in Derzor or in Raqqa, I mean, if they are, I mean, you know, like the, the Arabic Kurdish fraction, if they are going to report Kurdish issues from there, it's going to be completely um, complicated if it's Arab related, I mean, if it's issues then it's more complicated so most of the time they don't reveal who they are or they don't say that they work for an ability and we need to register ourselves in in northeast syria so this this is the complication of working on fire <laughs> that you have to to wrap up yourself and leave at any moment and besides the risks of the individual um colleagues who are in the different areas is there any campaign against the the newspaper or against yourselves by the regime and at a more yeah. national level yeah. yeah so we know that we we there is a campaign against us by the regime and we know that we are wanted now like we know we are blacklisted because in 2013 um uh the regime arrested one of my colleagues and then she her mother entrapped us because she was so it's a complicated story. The, the girl was arrested by the secret fo forces on a checkpoint that it's not like planned. That was like very haphazard. And they realized that she is a member of the female movement in Dari and also a co-founder of Annabelle D. So she was taken by the, by the intelligence forces. And then her mom came back to Syria from France to take care of the children. And then she was arrested by the regime. When So they allowed her to access Syria and to get to enter the country from the airport and then they followed her home so she was arrested with the children to practice more pressure and she called us and she invited us to see us so the two girls who arrived first they were arrested by the regime and they were also two co-founding members of the newspaper and we we survived by a miracle as well because i mean 
we had a code um, before, I mean, when the Syrian revolution started. So whenever I say it's over, by any context, you realize that I am in danger. So never come to me, whatever I say to you. So she said, like, we're ready. We are awaiting for you. And then she mentioned that it's over. Where are you now? And uh, we realized that they are detained now. They are arrested. So we had to return back. And we left the country in 2013. After, I mean, when we crossed the borders, we checked our names. We were not, I mean, so our names were, were not on the blacklist at the borders, but it was on the checkpoints all over Syria. So they smuggled us over, like from the checkpoints, we survived them and we crossed the country legally. We were super lucky to cross the country legally. But a few months later, a friend of mine, she returned back to the country to see her children and she was arrested by the regime and but i mean by then we realized that we are all wanted we are all blacklisted so this is also answers your, your question about the blacklists you don't know it happens you either realize when you are arrested or when somebody else is arrested that you are blacklisted and would you mind since you now touch on it with these two colleagues um they, uh, talk a, a little bit more about the women do you mm -hmm. had a big role in organizing women journalists around these this very difficult circumstances and how they were a little bit more perhaps vulnerable yes so also very proudly uh, when we uh, co-founded anna Beledi, women consisted six more than 60 percent of the co-founding members um, also, we didn't plan for this. It's just like when we agreed that we are going to participate and that we were like the majority were women. Um, it has pros and cons. So at the very beginning of the Syrian revolution, we were not stopped at the checkpoints and we were not searched because they pay more attention to women and they pay like they didn't want to clash with the communities, especially with the very uh, conservative communities that they are arresting their women or they are searching women, but it happened only up until the 2011. I mean, they arrested women before, but I mean, they, we were not searched. But immediately after, they started to search women and arrest them and torture them, and um, they never paid any attention for any gender uh, differences. But the pros of it is that since we are not searched at the checkpoints, I survived to smuggle the newspaper outside. I survived uh, to, to leave Dari and go participate in, in demonstrations in Damascus city or in any neighboring villages and towns. Um, I was also f more flexible than my, my male colleagues to go home so I can visit people and interview them and ask them about what atrocities happened to them, especially after the massacre that was committed by the regime in August 2012. So women were the ones who took on their uh, shoulders to go and interview other families on how their loved ones were persecuted and killed in front of them or how women were raped by the regime or how like they torch uh, or how they killed children for example back then so we were more flexible to go and have like live interviews with the people while for male it was like more dangerous they are stopped at each and every f checkpoint that's why we couldn't see them in person while the females used to meet more often and and together more often because i mean for us it's easier that we are gathering for a cup of coffee at the very beginning i'm speaking up until like even less than the end of 2011 while for men it's more dangerous for them to meet because they are at higher risk to be arrested so these are the pros while the cones um operating in a highly security sensitive environment um, that was a risk and also operating in a very conservative environment we were not taken seriously by most of the people so I remember uh, when a friend of mine wanted to go and interview one of the um, heads of the the back the back called free Syrian army he all he asked her go and send me someone else by someone else he meant a man but I mean she told him there's no one else but myself so he was forced to speak to her so we were not only um and um this is part of my my master's degree research it, w it was like how women not only fight the regime but we also were fighting hegemony within hegemony so we were fighting the regime but also we were fighting gender norms and journal gender dynamics in syria um 
up till this moment, I mean, it's it's easy to, uh, I mean, to have your voice, but also, for example, when we reported about rape in Syria, I mean, when the uh, massacre happened in 2012, in, in August 2012, the uh, regime thugs and soldiers, they raped women. And when we reported about that, we were accused of shaming and naming but we have never mentioned names but we were accused of naming and shaming and taunting the owner of our women and that was like we were backlashed by the community back then um so yeah it's just like um, it's it's highly sensitive it's very um risk like dangerous to be operating in such an environment but at the same time as i have mentioned now we are not only fighting the regime but also the extremists who consider us as not fully um in place or in position to, to say anything or even in in the political domain i mean you have to fight to have your say or to be a member of any um of the like um Let's say if you are part of the negotiations, uh, women are a minority in the negotiations. So, yeah, we still have another war to, to wage, fortunately. And one last question. It, through this process, mm -hmm. um, right now I'm going backwards from the consolidation of this independent media uh, outlet all the way back, what was the relationship with the international community mm -hmm. beyond Turkey, where you guys are obviously uh, located? Yeah. So when we started Anna Beledi, uh, we started very soon to get um, realized, if I may say so, by international like international media. So they started to come to us to ask us about special reports. They come to Daria, they smuggled themselves to see us especially Syrians who have another nationality, let's say a Syrian German, a Syrian American. When they come to Syria, they are Syrians, but then they are reporting to international media. So they used to visit us, um, report from the city or from neighboring cities. They used to consider us as one of their sources. So we report for them as well. So we had really uh, strong relations with um, international media outlets. And we started to get either news to them or, or images or footages for them. And um, later on, we coordinated with them a lot. And uh, um, like on, like for example, they ask us questions, for example, are you uh, willing to write an article in our newspaper only because they know that you are a co-founding member or someone who works in Hanabeledi. I'm speaking about an ability in particular. So um, we got attention of the international journalists. I can say names that I I know back to 2011 and 2012. Yeah. And during this time, you mentioned at least three colleagues mm -hmm. from um, from the newspaper. They had been arrested, mm -hmm. tortured, and, and disappeared. Did you ever? attempted as an individual or as a, as a group, as a professional enterprise to seek any accountability for their death within Syria or outside of Syria? We've been fighting for their justice since 2011 and 12 onward. Uh, personally, with my brother, I have knocked every single door and I haven't got an answer. I've also reached to ICRC once, and this is um, very ironic. I've written an email to someone at Damascus, I mean, in Damascus, at their Damascus office. And I said that somebody put me in touch with you, and this is my case. I need to know where my brother, or do you have access to see? I mean, I don't know. I don't want to access him now. I only want to know if he is alive or dead. It's for the sake of my mom. If she wants to go to bed, she knows if, if her boy is whatever. So the answer was so funny. I still keep that email. And she was like, unfortunately, we don't have access to prisons inside Syria, and I can't help you. With two sentences, she closed that down, and she never said anything. And... Um, I am a member of a movement called Families for Freedom, which is initiated by uh, females who lost their husbands, their brothers, their sisters. I mean, first tie or f like first connection to the uh, person detained. 
It was established in 2017, and up till this moment, we have never spared the moment to, to speak to the United Nations, to the Security Council, to everyone, even to the Geneva delegation, of, I mean, when they do um, the, um, when the delegation is, is negotiating Syria and, and the, the Syrian issue or calls, but then we've never got an answer. Up till this moment, we don't know where they are. But we never spur the moment. I've never spur with. I mean, it's not only because they are colleagues, but but personally, we have like personal ties with them. So yes, the rest of them, Nabil and the others, they are only colleagues, but they are more than this. Um, it's enough to say that we we used to have a dream, and we share that dream together, and. Um, that's enough to be more than any any blood ties, but also my brother is one among them. So um, yes, we've been fighting for them, but unfortunately, we have never heard anything, not from the Security Council, not from the regime side, not from the international bodies and organizations, including the ICRC, which is, I mean, looked at somebody which is powerful to get access to prisons, but they don't have access to prisons in Syria. And I don't know if this is political, if this is done deliberately by countries that they don't want to set or put Assad, per I mean, um, accountable for all the crimes that he perpetrated, or it's done because um, they have any political, um, I don't know, arrangements, but it's... Um, it's always that no answer is coming from anyone. And re only recently we started to have, to see tribunals, um, especially in Koblenz and Frankfurt in Germany, but nothing beyond that. And um, I don't know if it's appropriate to, men to mention this in public and in front of everyone here. I've lost faith in any kind of justice. If you ask me why I continue, I continue because I, I survived and they didn't. And uh, I don't know why I survived. I wish I couldn't or I've never been here. But um, I have that burden, which is a burden that I have to call for. I have to, to be here for them because they have no chance to be here. And because I believe if, if I was killed under torture or if I am in prison and they are outside, they will never spare a moment to, to look for me. They could have done more than what I have done. I am so confident and I feel sorry that I'm not doing anything for them and I couldn't succeed in the past 10 years to say or do anything for them, but um, I lost faith. Why I am here, it's only because I think it's going to be in their records and in my records just to say that Maybe if I go to bed in the in the evening, um, I'll tell myself I've done something, but it's a big lie. Thank you very much. Rune Tepano has any questions? Yes, we have a, a question from Gil. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Um, that was an amazing journey uh, for you over the last 10 or so years and, and indeed today. Very moving. Um, and I admire your uh, courage and your persistence. I just have two, two quick questions. I was wondering um, if there are ever warnings given to people um, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be killed, stop this, you shouldn't do that. And, and the second thing, um, in most uh, accounts that I have seen about totalitarian regimes and some that I've, I've observed closely, um, there are always a, a network, uh, some voluntary, some involuntary, uh, of what we might call spies or informers. And is, is that something that has operated in Syria? 
Thank you, sir. This is highly appreciated and your questions are highly valid. Um, to answer your first question, if there are any warnings given to people, never. So in the case of my brother, uh, he was doing his master's degree in macroeconomics and excuse me if I will be very emotional, but they deserve to be known. Um, he could have been now one of the most prominent economists in the world. He had a dream to finish his university, do his master's degree at Damascus, and then move to Germany, I don't know why, and, and do his PhD. But he was arrested when he was doing his first degree, I mean his first year at the master's degree. Um, he was very intelligent, very smart, and he could have changed the face of the Syrian politics, maybe, if he is given the chance, but we lost them since May 2012. Uh, when they broke into my home, they broke into my home at 12.30 in the a.m. So we were all, at, I mean, in bed. I was not. I was doing something um, on the desktop. But my brother, because of his connections with friends, he, he knew that he, he might be wanted by the regime. So prior to that, he used not to sleep very often at home. So he used to sleep elsewhere. That night, he came back home, and I wish he didn't. They broke into home 15 soldiers, fully armed. They threatened us, and they searched the house. They turned it into, they turned everything into chaos. My elder brother was married with two kids. The youngest was like less than a year old. And they, they broke into their room and I was shouting to them like, we have kids at home, so please don't point your arms into them. And he threatened that he's going to kill me. He threatened my mom to kill her. He threatened to kill my dad, my, my other youngest brother and my sister-in-law. But then to answer your second question about voluntary and involuntary uh, spies or whatever you can call them. Yes, uh, it's very obvious because when they broke into my home, they were asking for another name. My, my brother's name is Ahmed Hilmi. So they were looking for Shadi al Najid, And it's a completely different name. It's a completely different family name. And they left. So in a th few minutes, they returned back home again. And they searched the house again. And they were looking for the guy who is doing master's degree at Damascus University. So I, I introduced myself as I am doing my master's degree at Damascus University. And they asked me to shut up because they are looking for a male, not a female. And that was my brother. So they took him. One of the, I mean, among the, so 15 soldiers came first. And then another, I think, 15 others because they were different. Um, looking uh, came second and one of them was masked and if there is something that I feel very sorry for and maybe it's um I don't know but I really wanted to, to unmask him but I was really afraid that they will shot everyone dead at home mm -hmm. because I know that that person was the one who took my brother into jail or into detention why he is masked. Others say that maybe he is not the one who reported your brother, but it's just like in the security forces. But I know that everyone arrested was arrested because somebody reported. Thank you. Thank you. Governor. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Kalut, thank you so much for your most moving uh, testimony. Um, and I thank you particularly for also telling us about the women journalists and the statement that you made that there's still another war to fight. I think that is something that many of us can relate to. Um, my questions are, are related more to um, your publication and its outreach. Um, since you set it up in Turkey, um, I'm presuming most of the news you're getting is from the regime-controlled parts of Syria. Um, are you also publishing 
um, uh, and getting news from the other regions which are controlled by others. And related to that, uh, given that Turkey is not exactly a democracy, um, what kind of dangers do you pay, face from the regime in Turkey? Uh, if you so much as even hint at uh, some violations, say, in the areas controlled by the Turkish forces. Um, so what are the dangers you, as journalists uh, operating from Turkey, would face? Is it deportation? Uh, uh, it would be useful for us to know. Thank you very much for your uh, questions. So um, currently, Anna Beledi has over one million uh, subscribers on Facebook, and our traffic to our, I mean, to our website, uh, it's a million. Uh, it used to be, um, not used, it was, I think, over 25 million last year, in 2021. I mean, the traffic to the website during the 12 months. And as I have mentioned, now we are considered one of the most prominent uh, news outlets in Syria, and it's... Um, considered as a credible, credible source of information to most of the international um, and news outlets in, I mean, globally. Um, yes, we report news from inside the regime. We also report news from like out of regime control, like from northeast Syria, northwest. And we also report about uh, the status of Syrians inside Turkey and in diaspora as well. Everything related to the Syrians, and it's of interest to the Syrians, we report that. Um, our main focus on the news coming from Turkey is how to help Syrians get their legal papers, how to get the, help them go get access from here and there, and how to bring the Syrians and the Turkish people together, especially after the racism campaigns that has been rising for the past two or three years against the Syrian presence in Turkey. But, of course, this poses so many dangers to our presence as media outlets inside uh, Turkey and in any other countries, especially if the political um, domain is changing. So let's say um, we are registered in Germany and in the United States. So let's say, if it's not, I mean, the situation in Turkey is very volatile. But let me give another example about the United States, let's say, or in Germany. Let's imagine that the right wing won and they took over the power in Germany and they don't want anyone to be present or reporting from, in, in, from inside Germany, let's say. And um, we are seeing that the, the, the right wing is winning most of the, um, the I mean, most of the countries around the world. So, and, and voices of racism is increasing in every single country. So imagine that this is the, the political, I mean, situation or de facto in any other, in any country outside Syria changes. We have to wrap ourselves and leave that country and go to another place to establish ourselves and, and operate from a different um, country. So the, the, the things related to Turkey is that, yes, we are fully registered, but, but as I have mentioned, we cannot get work permits. It's not an easy process. Now, racism is against Syrians, so if it's not from the government itself, maybe it's from the people around you. You might be stabbed in the street. You might be tortured in the street by anyone. You might be subject to any racism in Turkey, and no one is going to defend you because, I mean, no one is going to defend you in Turkey. Um, so, yes, if, if I mean, when even when we report about something that happened inside, let's say, Turkish-dominated uh, regions and we say like something happened we count to 10 before we publish anything but then is it the credibility of your news or your 50 percent of your safety it's credibility of the news unfortunately because i mean we don't have the luxury to hide behind our fingers so we're taking risks everywhere we're taking risks everywhere even inside syria i mean our reporters are not safe whenever they are reporting because I have men as I have mentioned, we are considered the enemy for not only the Syrian regime, but almost every single one um, having a voice there as a power. I mean, raising arms against people. I want to know more about the Nabil role in your media. Yeah. Before he, he 
was captured and well that's the first to capture thank you very much so as i have mentioned nabil's idea was to have a newspaper for our own and he was advocating for this idea so we started the newspaper uh, being the only media graduate only person who has previous journalistic experience he was our mentor so he was the one um, making sure that we are accountable for our credibility of sources double checking our sources not um, pushing the Syrian venue or the Syrian map towards violence let's say or not pushing us to be uh, an outlet for disinformation and we owe him a lot in this regard because I mean now we are fighting disinformation inside Syria whether from the regime side or any other um, even countries that support the regime especially including Russia where we have to fight their disinformation campaigns um, we owe Nabil this, we owe Nabil everything that started. He could be our managing ed editor now, or the editor-in-chief if he could have been given the chance to survive. Um, so everything that we are now, yes, we got so many trainings after we lost him, but the first editorial line was put by Nabil as the expert, and we helped him in that. So... Um, yeah, I mean, it's not only Nabil, I mean, to be very honest, it's not only Nabil, Nabil was on the editorial side, but to be very honest, I think that I have also the burden to say something about another colleague whose name is Mohammed Kreitem. We lost him by a, a, a regime attack to his home in December 2012. Um, Mohammed was the one who sat all our policies, our uh, organizational structure, why we need to have elections for the board members, why we have to have an editing manager, an editor-in-chief. So he was the one concerned with our uh, policies. And after we lost him, we won Ahmed Shahade. He was detained by the regime twice, and then he was killed by another missile in that area. Ahmed was an economist as well and a finance person. So he set our financial strategy very proudly, we owe them a lot. So without Mohammed Kreitem, we will never have an organization and we could have failed in less than two years. Without Nabil, we would never had an editorial policy and we could have failed ages ago. And without Ahmed Shahade, we could have never had a financial policy or strategy and we could have gone bankrupt ages ago. Now we have funds and sources from multiple donors so they don't affect or impact our editorial policies. This could have never happened without having Ahmed on board or having Nabil on board to say that you don't need to do this and you don't need to do that. So, Anna um, Beledi was so lucky to have them on board, but we are so desperate to lose them so early. Um, and how, when you began, you, uh, when you start your uh, your media, your magazine, no? How did you fund it, the publication? Yes. Uh, if you, uh, first, and I also, what happened, if, if what happened in your case of the protagonist of, journal, of journalist women in Syria, it happened in other, Yes, in the whole country, if you can talk more about the role of the women journalists mm -hmm. in this. And the other thing, you talk about the disinformation campaigns, no, for Russia. Yeah. Uh, how this other kind uh, of threat or attacks affect you? Yeah. What are the other new ways to target journalists uh, or critical media? No. Yeah. Thank you very much. So regarding your funding, up until 2014, we, we were not in need for funds because we were, um, any, I mean, up until the end of 2012, we were at home and uh, there's no need to get your 
I mean, we jeopardized the, the idea of I need to be paid to survive because we were home and we were not in need for a salary to survive. So we were working pro bono. Um, the money that we got funding the printing of the newspaper, we used to receive 3,000 Syrian pounds back then, which is nothing now. But we used to receive it from an unknown person only to fund the ink and the printing of the newspaper. And I realized that it was Ahmed Shahde. Um, may his soul rest in peace, the one we lost in, in a missile attack in Daria. So that no, no funding was needed up until 2014 when we had to leave the country and we are in diaspora, so we have to live in Turkey. So it's not only that you need to be, uh, to serve, but you need to survive and support your family. And um, since 2013, we started to get small funds like a thousand, euros from an organization but then it's only for the internet but then we started to collect um funds from other organizations to survive so uh when we started we didn't need any funds because we were home and we were working pro bono um uh, the second question the role of women journalists um women were heavily present in the activist movement in syria since the beginning of 2011 in march 2011 and they were journalists, they were um, several doctors were helping the injured and uh, many of them helped um, uh, break the siege from certain cities and towns were besieged at early 2011 and 2012. So in particular in journalism, as I have mentioned, we had a freer access to communities and to interview people. So we had freer access and we had more um, more uh, presence in how to cover things but i want to mention something that i forgot to mention is that um being women and it's not to belittle anyone here i with all due respect but sometimes you see that men are more interested in covering viol not violence i'm not going to say this but in covering things that are of interest to them which is like let's say the um, military advancements in Syria, it's almost covered by male reporters. The clashes between so and so and so and forth, which is like political angles from here and there, they are more interested in action. Like this one, um, if I may say an example about the dog who, who has beaten or ha has bite some, a man. So they are the ones who report about that. Women, on the other hand, is like we are more interested in human, like in human stories, and how the Syrian uprising has impacted our lives in particular. So we took the the opportunity to report in depth about how women survived being single mothers, not single mothers in the sense of being single mothers, but how a woman survives the absence of her husband because he is detained or killed. How what are the challenges they face to raise the children in a very challenging environment. So we brought that sense of in-depth human coverage to the story, so we bring it back to the people. Uh, but unfortunately, we got a role, but it, we were always confronted by the social, political, gender dynamics in the country. So um, if you work very hard, you never be an editor in chief or a managing editor or whatever, because a man is there to cover your place because you know they know better than you. Um, sometimes, and, and um, even in politics and negotiation, it's always the role of men that goes and takes the leads in negotiations, and they never get women. But in the Syrian, I mean, I'm speaking about Syria, so I'm not getting, like, no one gets me wrong. So it's always women are vases, you know, just like next to a man to be a decoration. Um, uh, so this, I mean, they had a great role in, in starting news outlets. Several women co-founded news um, papers and even radios and uh, magazines. Uh, the third question about disinformation campaigns, especially by Russia, it seems that we are, I mean, at the beginning, to be very honest with you, when we started to hear on the Syrian TV that the demonstrations in Syria are fake, that everything happening in Syria is ready-made or prepared in Qatar studios for Al Jazeera or elsewhere, we used to laugh. I used to roll over the floor because of this. Um, 
I don't feel ashamed to say I was naive because I believed in human rights even back then. But, um, I mean, we used to belittle them every now and then. So, oh my God, they oh, look at that joke. I mean, they said that the extremists, they have done um, and like an explosion that happened in El Maidan, which is a neighborhood in Damascus. And then you see, like, I will never forget that photo footage on the Syrian TV where we had um, a bucket of yogurt and some oranges in a in a bush in a bush like in a in a sack like little sack and then there was a car bombed and flames everywhere um fumes everywhere and then the 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 yogurt bucket is intact and the oranges are freshly thrown in the place so we started to say oh look at that joke i mean if they have to dumb it you know it's it's a dummy but if you have they make it they didn't work it very well i mean they didn't know the scenario of how to fake things so um but then i realized that it really impacted how the international community and how foreigners how the other have seen syria especially with the russian campaigns when it started to be like the um the Syrian revolution is fake, all the demonstrations are fake, all the torture and everything inside the prisons are fake, and they have campaigns, they have the money, and they have the power, and they have the platforms to do this. While we didn't have the money, we didn't have the power, we didn't have the platforms to counter this information. Now we find ourselves that we have to prove ourselves as right. We have the power to say this and this happened to me now if i mention anything to people that um the regime has done this to the people they say but on another channel it says it's fake and i never feel ashamed that all the exaggeration with numbers at the very beginning of the syrian demonstration because citizen journalists were in the street and they were like very afraid and they were so taken by surprise that, oh, they've killed us, they shelled us. I mean, they killed hundreds of people. And then you realize it's 10, it's not 100. So everything that we have to counter, I mean, we've done in the past, we have to counter now, but then it's us who are paying the price for that, that we have to prove that things happened. We have to double check the numbers that happened 10 years ago, but we are working alone. We don't have access to double check most of the numbers because they have gone with the wind when they arrested the people and most of the evidence has gone, especially the ones, I mean, it's not only the ones went with Nabil, the two women colleagues who were arrested by the regime, they were entrapped by the mother of my friend, as I have mentioned earlier. When they were taken by the regime, they arrested them with their laptops and the hard drives, because it's so dangerous to keep your laptop and hard drive at home so somebody raids the house. So you take that with you, and then it happened that you are arrested, and then you, we lose the archive. We lost our archives. I wish I could find an image of me in one of the demonstrations or something, but it's just like you have to search the internet to find it. We don't have any archives. And as I have mentioned, it's going to be written by the victorious, and the victorious now is al-Assad regime. And then they are going to have their own story told, and I have to believe it. Unfortunately, similar to the fact that I have to believe that Assad won, so let's naturalize our relations with him. Let's go back to his table. Thank you. There's no more questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>